Hey everyone, I'm Brian Parks, and in this video, I want to show something that's that's kind of a, a nuanced feature of C Sharp, and that is referencing DLLs specifically at runtime from outside of your project. So it's it's pretty straightforward to reference a DLL uh, at compile time outside of your project. You just add a, a, a reference uh, in Solution Explorer, uh, and at when you compile the 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 compiler, the Visual Studio, will automatically pull in that DLL and you'll have access to every, everything you need. That's not an issue. But what if you are if you need to integrate with a piece of software where you don't actually have the rights to uh, distribute their DLLs, um, but you know that uh, whoever is going to use your software, they will have a copy of that DLL on their system. And that's okay. You know, th this is kind of a nuanced area, uh, but it is... Uh, a, a, a very valid point. It also means that you, rather than packaging these DLLs with your your software, you know, even if you do have the rights to do that, you might not want to because you might want to keep your .NET DLL specifically or your .NET executable just the executable. You don't want to be sending around giant zip files or you know build massive installers. You want to just be able to distribute a, a single. Exe, kind of this the, the portable exe approach um, without doing you know static compilation because uh, .NET even in the newer versions of .NET Core and .NET uh, 5 still doesn't really have a good uh, single assembly um, mechanism so you, it, it's a little bit harder to do that that static compilation portable executable sort of thing but it is nice if you can just reference DLLs that already exist on the system. Um, and that, that's fantastic. Obviously, there's the GAC, uh, the, the Global Assembly Cache, um, but not all DLLs are installed there, and actually in newer versions of .NET, uh, that's, that's being discouraged. Uh, things are moving away from the GAC. Um, but that doesn't mean that the assemblies that you need aren't already installed on, on the system, especially if you're trying to integrate with a specific program that you know people are going to be using. So let's, let's get into a demo. And uh, here I have Visual Studio uh, pulled up. I just created a new .NET Framework application. Uh, what I'm going to show does work in .NET Core as well, um, but I, I picked .NET Framework because it's it's where I, I was. It's what I was using when I, when I had to had to solve this problem. So as I mentioned, you can easily just go references at reference, go to browse, and let's say you know this this shutterpilot.printing DLL. Um, Shutterpilot is one of my companies. Uh, obviously, I have the rights to this DLL, so this this is less of an issue. But it's a it's a DLL that I know I can show on camera and uh, and, and show using. So obviously, you could just say that and then say OK, and then you're good. And then let me let me pull this properties window out, and it's in the middle here. You'll notice this copy local true. Uh, this is how you would normally do things if you just uh, grabbed a, a an assembly. You know, maybe you downloaded it from from a vendor. You know, Telerik or uh, Dev Express or something like that. Uh, you installed the DLLs and then you could reference them directly and uh, package them up with your app. That's not a problem. But what we're going to show, let me dock that window again, is how you can actually reference them without. Uh, without really doing that. Um, so the important part is that at runtime, there is no, uh, uh, that, that DLL is not loaded into your, um, your app domain, your program uh, immediately. It's only loaded when it's referenced. So that means that when program.cs runs, even if I have that, that reference over there, that DLL will not get loaded because I don't use it anywhere. And that's an important point that we'll actually come back to in a minute. But let's say we don't want to ship that shutterpilot.printing DLL with this particular program. But we know that it is going to exist on disk. Let's say uh, in... This is just going to be a string. Um, see my DLLs. 
Right, totally contrived path, but you get the idea. That's great, but how do we tell the .NET runtime to look there? Well, it turns out that there's this uh, event on the app domain. So app domain dot current domain. And for some reason, IntelliSense is not uh, cooperating with me today, but I promise it's there. It's this assembly resolve event. So let's do that. And sure, let's let's grab that name. Okay, so now we have this method here, and you'll notice that it take it's just an event handler. It takes a, a sender and some args, and it returns an assembly. And this is the assembly from the system that reflection namespace. So this this is important. It's not just a piece of code that runs and maybe it does something and maybe it doesn't this event handler has to return an assembly, which actually can be null. We'll see that in a minute. So how do you load an assembly? Well, typically you do assembly dot, uh, assembly dot load. The problem with that is that it takes an assembly string. This is the, the long form of the name. So when you see um, in the output window, when, when .NET processes start up, you'll see the list of assemblies that it's loading. That's the long name, uh, which is really just the name of the assembly, uh, maybe the name of the file that it's in, but it doesn't include things like the actual path to the file. So the runtime is responsible for finding those assemblies. However, there is another function, uh, another static function on the assembly class called load from and that takes a path so in this case we could do you know let's grab dll location it's actually removed from there because we're not going to use it up there dll location we could say path dot combine dll location and something. We'll get back to the something. Obviously, we need to using in order to use paths. We need system.io. Now let's look in this args because that's where we're actually going to get the name from. So args dot name. Pretty straightforward, right? Now I don't recall. We'll have to find out together. I don't recall if the name actually includes the .dll, or if it, uh, or if it, it, it if it's just the 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 name without the extension. So that's basically it. Now the question is, what happens if this DLL doesn't exist in that location? Well, this assembly .load from call, we'll throw an exception, and that's bad. We don't want that. So what we really want to do is do a, let's actually do this path.combine separately. Right, save it as, as DLL path. And then what we'll do is if file uh, exists, DLL path, else will return null. And again, assembly.load from uh, does return an assembly, so we can just return that because we do need to return an assembly from this, this method. We'll, uh, we'll pass DLL path there. All right, so now let's actually do something that requires uh, this uh, this code to run. So let me set a breakpoint on line 22 here. And now we get to the next nuance. And that is that, as I mentioned before, this code has to be in place before you try to reference something from uh, that, that DLL. And that DLL is only pulled in, uh, or 
the runtime attempts to resolve it as soon as it knows it's going to need something from that assembly. The question is, when, when is that? And it turns out that that is whenever you reference a type that depends on that assembly. So basically, the short version is, if you have a using that uh, points to that assembly, that means that file or that class will cause the loading of that assembly when it's loaded. So if I try to, to be honest, I don't remember what's in shutterpilot.printing. It's been a while since I wrote that DLL. Uh, sure. I think even that will trigger it. So we'll set a breakpoint here. We'll set a breakpoint here. And if I run this, what you'll see is that it'll load just fine because I didn't actually make one important configuration change. Right now, we're still uh, referencing this DLL in a way where it's copied into this uh, project's uh, bin directory. Now, what I want to do is click false for copy local so that it doesn't copy it. I can still reference it. I can still get IntelliSense from it. It just won't be copied when the project builds. So that's good. Let's move this back into, move this back out of the way. And I'm going to clean because that DLL has already been copied to the output directory. I want it to go away. And now let's try it again. So now we hit that breakpoint, and it worked just fine. I think there's still something weird going on. Give me just a second here. Nope, it's gone. So I think I think I didn't actually trigger it because it doesn't really care what that type is. Let's do new JSON print template. I'm pretty sure that type has a, has a constructor. So when I try to run that, uh, I don't need this this anymore. So let me see. When I try to run that, it should actually die a horrible death. Yeah, there we go. Could not load file or assembly shutterpilot.printing. Okay, now let's change this. I know that this DLL actually lives in program files x86 uh, shutterpilot capture. Though you'll notice this breakpoint was hit this breakpoint was not. So even if I change this to the correct path, I need to stop it and restart it. It's still gonna, it's still gonna die because it's loading program.cs and trying to resolve those types before it knows how to actually get access to those types. So rather than putting the actual stuff that uses that type, uh, in in the same class, I need to create a new class add class and I'm gonna be very uninvent uninventive here we'll call this class the do stuff class and we'll give it one static method. called run. Takes no arguments. All it's going to do is that's run that same line of code. I guess this will need to be internal's fine, but let's let's be explicit and make it public. And here 
you need to do do stuff dot run dot run All right and let's take this out because it says it's no longer needed and let's see let's add some breakpoints back All right All right, it looks like we forgot to add some usings. There we go. Now we should be able to run. And now it hits our, our custom assembly resolve method. And if we look at args.name, turns out that is not what I wanted. Let's figure out what it is that I want. So here down in uh, locals, you'll see you'll see that information down in args and you can see that uh, the, the part that we really want is that first part of the name so let's let's hit stop let's do args.name.split on comma and get the first item right that seems reasonable that's gotta be a character there we go and we'll probably want to add dot dll to the end, right? dll, there we go. Okay, obviously not going for performance here. You can clean this up a little bit. But now let's see what happens. Okay, so we've got args.name, we're splitting, we're adding dot dll to the end. dll path should be something reasonable. Yep, that looks right. And now if file exists, file does exist, return assembly.load from, continue, and now we hit our breakpoint. Success. So now if I go back to here, bin debug, this is where it's running from, you can see even if I refresh, that DLL has not been copied here. And as evidenced by the code that runs, it can't load it from the local directory, it goes and runs my custom assembly resolve method and is able to pick it up from the, the directory that I specify. So a lot of nuanced things there, uh, but that's basically it. Uh, there is actually another way you can handle this, which uh, is certainly a more advanced topic, but by way of teaser, we'll do app domain, and I'm not actually going to run this, but app domain .create domain and we'll hit F12. There is an overload, there are a couple overloads actually, that have this app base path. And what that means is that uh, rather than running uh, as if the app is running in the current directory where the, the entry point is, um, this doesn't change the current working directory by the way. This just changes the app base path where the app thinks it's running from for purposes of resolving uh, DLLs. So you can actually specify an app base path of somewhere else, and then you don't have to go through the the um, all of this current domain assembly resolve stuff uh, because it'll just pick up DLLs from uh, the the path that you specified there. Of course, if you do want to access DLLs that are in the same directory as the uh, the entry point for your program, then you will have to do this current domain assembly resolve. So you could do something like a single executable with no other dependencies, creating a new app domain to run stuff in that has as its app base path some other directory and then do everything in that other app domain. Again, that's a more advanced topic for a separate video, um, but hopefully this gives you an idea of how you can reference uh, DLLs from other programs uh, kind of as if they're plugins and not have to ship them with your own code. So, if you found that interesting, go ahead and give this video a like. Uh, subscribe to the channel for more like this, uh, and I also do uh, some other uh, types of videos on the channel as well. You can, you can check out uh, previous videos for examples of some of those. Share this with your friends, coworkers, uh, anyone you think might be interested in it. 
Uh, I think this is a really interesting topic, and I think this is a really cool thing that C-Sharp is able to do. Uh, so I, I, as you can tell, I love talking about it. But that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.